Father, we come before you. We thank you for how great and how wonderful and how good of Elohim, a God that you are. You deserve our praise, Lord. You deserve all the honor and all the glory, Lord. As the song said, Lord, open up our hearts and let you in. Lord, we want to do that tonight, and we want to ask that you would speak uh, tonight and not me. God, I pray that every word that I say would be salted, Lord, from your word that would come straight from the Shemaim, straight from the heavens, straight from your throne, and that you would penetrate the hearts of your people, Lord, and prick them to go deeper, farther, and wider uh, than they've ever gone before, Lord. Let them learn how to swim in the water of your word, Lord, not just watch it run over their ankles. God, make us different. Change us. Draw us into the holy chambers, Lord, that you design for us. Lord, help us to sit on your throne with you, to sit on your lap, Lord, and teach us how to be the kings and priests that you called us to be. And everyone said, amen. amen. All right. Well, you know, amazingly, the worship team, uh, my wife, when she chose uh, this set, for the worship uh, tonight, she had no idea uh, what, the, what the message I was going to bring was going to be. And so that very last song, as we begin, multiple times we see this happen prophetically, where God will set up a song and, uh, and it, will, it will either flow right into the message or someone will have a vision or a word from the Lord and they don't know what the song is, but it'll be directly you know, attached to that. And, and once again, it happens tonight because this entire last uh, song of open up the, the doors of our heart and let us in, let him in, is all about wanting, uh, it's all about the message that I have tonight. And so the message that I have as I am uh, talking about Passover season is tonight's title is Passover, the Threshold Covenant. It's all about letting in the God of the universe through the threshold of your heart uh, to dine with you. And so I, I thought apropos that God is so detailed that he would even set up uh, this message with the song uh, that he chose. And so let's begin and see uh, what we can learn tonight about the threshold covenant, because it goes far deeper than you might realize or recognize when we talk about thresholds. Everybody knows what thresholds are, the thresholds of a door. Well, we're going to get into the depth of what a biblical ancient uh, uh, Eastern threshold covenant is and why the Passover is so important, why the Passover lamb was so important, why did Yeshua have to die, and why is he called the Passover lamb and dealing with the threshold and opening up the doors and, and in Exodus when, it, when they're putting the, the blood over the lintel and the doorpost and all of that. What is all that about? We're going we're gonna to dive into that tonight. So let's begin. The altar. If someone was going to make a covenant with someone, it was not going to be a sacrifice in ancient times, where would that, that, uh, that sacrifice be killed? Where would that animal be killed? If they were going to make a covenant with someone, where does the animal get killed? Very good. At the door. And specifically at the threshold of the door is where it was killed. And so, whereas in today's farming, you know, if you want to kill an animal, normally you go out, you know, to the slaughterhouse or you're out in, in the field somewhere or by the barn. You certainly don't do it on your front porch. But in ancient times, this is exactly what they did. And there was a reason for it. And it sets up the entire purpose uh, and, and stage for our Messiah and why uh, what the Passover was all about and what he fulfilled it to the very team. Specifically, it was at a threshold. So what you're looking at right now is a 2,500-year-old uh, threshold floor of a door. Now, this isn't a normal house, uh, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an exaggerated view for you to get an idea of exactly what the ancient thresholds look like. You have that uh, indention, looks like a bowl. That's exactly what it is. It's called a basin. And you also see that groove uh, that is in the threshold, that is where the blood goes. And I'm going to explain a little bit more about that a little bit later because I think it's going to really deepen your understanding, your appreciation for a lot of scriptures are going to come to life through it. Number one, to step over the threshold is to covenant with the person inviting you to that dinner. When you step over the threshold, when, you, when someone comes to your door, how many know that if they're visitors, uh, and you don't want them to, you know, you, you don't really know them. You talk to them over the threshold. You're on one side of the threshold. They're on the other side of the threshold. And there is communication happening, but there's no relationship that's developing. But when someone comes in, is invited to come into the threshold, 
over the threshold. That is the only reason why you would do that in ancient times is to dine with someone and you're creating relationship. You're creating a deep, meaningful relationship. That's the whole point of the threshold. So what, where's all the blood coming in and why are they doing this ancient strange custom? We're going to talk about that. To step on the, so stepping over the threshold means that you're intending to come in and dine with that person. To step on the threshold or the blood, okay, is to show contempt for the person of the house. You don't ever in ancient culture step on the threshold. You made it very clear that you would step over the threshold. Very, very deep meanings, as you're going to discover, but you would never step on the threshold because you would be stepping on that little canal that had blood running through it, which is showing contempt for the person that's inviting you over. Much like uh, in, ancient, uh, in the Far East cultures today, or the Middle Eastern cultures today, if you take your shoe off, or if you, like Americans like to sit and cross their legs, well, if you do that in Middle Eastern culture, if you show someone the bottom of your foot, you're showing contempt and disgust for them because of what is on the bottom of your feet. And, uh, and this is the exact same type of thing thousands of years ago. If you wanted to show contempt for someone, you would, you would show up on their front doorstep and you would step on that threshold and break that covenant. Matter of fact, how many know that the, that the wedding ceremony, where did that, that tradition come from of carrying the bride over the threshold? Anybody wonder where that comes from? Right here. This is where it comes from. Uh, matter of fact, uh, even in African-American cultures, they call it to, I think it's called jump the broom. They would put a broom at the threshold, they would jump over it, or they would leap over it, and it is this exact concept of where it comes from. It's from the ancient Hebrew culture of stepping over the threshold, because they said it's bad luck if you step on the threshold or, or if she comes through by herself. You are to carry the bride over the threshold and create covenant. Elements of that come all the way back. Blood of a sacrificed animal must be placed on the threshold of the home. Upon crossing the threshold, the new bride is adopted into the husband's family. It's the way it is even today. Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 9 reads this. It says, in the same day also will I punish all those that leap on the threshold which fill their master's house with violence and deceit. Do you see that illusion that you would never catch if you didn't understand the threshold covenant or these ancient customs? Because he's saying that I will punish anyone that stomps, it would be a good English word, or steps on that threshold because it's filling the master's houses with violence. You're starting a fight when you do that. Anybody that breaks the covenant uh, of the threshold whether in ancient cultures or today, and we'll bring it up to modern culture to see how it relates, God will punish. That's what he says. We're going to find out why. Another interesting thing about the, the threshold and going back to Exodus and the Passover and the door and how they put the blood on the doorpost is that you see something interesting. Why did he choose to put it on the doorpost and why on the lintel? It was common in ancient times to put names, pictures, uh, and symbols of deities on the sides and the top of every door because those pictures and those symbols and those names of the deities would quote unquote protect that house. And so that deity or that God, as we know, they're not any real gods, but this is what they believed. Uh, the demonic gods or, or the occult would protect that house if it saw its name or its deity. So you can see even in this picture here, they put as many deities as they could. How many remember Paul on Mars Hill? What was, he had all the way up the hill, all these gods lined up, and what was the last one? The unknown God. Pretty, pretty smart. Just in case we missed one, we want to make sure we don't make any gods upset. And so this custom is, was in place at the time that the Passover happened. So isn't it interesting that when God gives the commandments on Mount Sinai, we, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it's called the Shema. What is he telling his people to do? To write the commandments on your doorpost and then take the blood of the sacrificed animal and put it on the doorpost. Why? He's making a connection that the only thing that's going to protect you is the symbol of my 
power and authority, which is found in the blood of the Lamb. We'll bring some allusions here in just a minute. This is why when the blood is placed on that doorpost all the way back 3,200 years ago, some odd, you will, you, the, the Spirit of God comes, that death angel comes, and he sees that blood. Now, we've all been taught that the Passover is the spirit at death angel passing over the house. We've seen, you know, Charleston Heston. We've seen the, the whole thing, right? It was cartoons all alike. The spirit of God or that death angel crossing, passing over. I'm going to submit to you tonight that because that, because that is a lack of understanding of the threshold covenant of what's really happening. And we're going to break down the word Passover here so you can see in depth what really happened that night and how beautiful it really was. First, we get to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 9. Thou shalt write them on the post of your house and on your gates. Every week, one of our children will say the Shema, and they ends with on the doorposts of our house and on our gates. And then we applause because it's all about taking God's word and writing them on the doorposts of our house and on our gates, on the frontlets between our, our eyes and on our hands. Now, the Jewish Orthodox community, will, uh, they will put the uh, tefillim, and the phylacteries on their head and on their hand as a physical sign uh, of, this, uh, of this commandment. But in reality, what God is trying to say is that my words need to be in your mind all the time, and you need to do them. That's why it's called Shema, hear and do. There's no such thing in Hebrew culture, or there's no such thing in biblical, God-fearing people culture that say, I follow God, I hear what God says, but I don't do what he says. The book of James says that, that, that you are basically stepping on God. You are looking into his law and you are walking away and forgetting what, what you look like. You're a hearer only, not a doer. That is not a, a biblical, that's not biblical faith. Biblical faith proves its faith and its belief system by what it does. The power of God is limited to what you do through faith. So the doorpost, interesting, uh, the, those are mezuzahs, if you haven't guessed, and every Jewish uh, person that's a practicing uh, Jew has one of these on their doors, and they will touch it, and they will put it on their lips uh, every time they walk through that threshold. The word mezuzah is do doorpost in Hebrew, if you didn't know, and the beauty behind what they're doing sim symbolically is that when they touch that, they are saying, I want the commandments to be right here. I want them to be in my lips. I, they're, they're fulfilling, in a way, symbolically, the scripture of between the frontlets of my eyes and on my hands. I want them to be, because what, the, what does the scripture say in John? Confess with your mouth. Don't remain silent. Speak as you walk through the threshold to dine with your king. Confess. Confess that he is your king. Every word that you go, write them on your heart. Proverbs 7, chapter 2 Verse two, keep my commandments and live in my law as an apple of your eye. Bind them upon your fingers. Write them upon the tablets of your heart. It's another illusion of the Deuteronomy chapter six of the Shema. He wants you to absolutely don't forget. And we think the whole putting a finger, a string on your finger, we just, Americans are brilliant. We just thought of that, right? It's right here in chapter seven of Proverbs. Put a finger, put a string, put a finger on your string. Put a string on your finger. Remember, God says, don't forget about me. Why do you think he says, when you rise up and when you lie down, don't forget about me, meditate upon me. Why? Because you are bent, since I put you out of the garden, to forget yeah. about me and to do things your way. That's why he creates these cycles of righteousness and all these curriculums of the feast days and the things he puts before us. Where was the new covenant made, by the way? Jeremiah 31, 33 says this, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And if you see the allusion to the threshold covenant, you will understand this means so much more because what are you according to the scriptures? You are the temple of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. If you are the temple, you have a threshold and you have an inner holy place. The threshold is the heart. This is why there's so many uh, idiomatic expressions dealing with the heart in the scriptures. Because it is this, it's called the seat of the emotions. Heart in Hebrew is lev, which is lamed 
and bait together. Those two, which by the way, is the first and last letter of the Torah when you put it together. The very first letter of the Bible is bait. The very last letter of the Torah is Lamed. You put it together, you have heart. The heart of God is the commandments of God. Through, written through the Spirit of God. So when you consume the, the Word of God on the inside, you are opening up the heart of God and you are letting Him in by learning His commandments because it says, write them on your heart. When you write His commandments on your heart, ladies and gentlemen, our relationships work the same way. This is not spiritual theology. If you want to have a fantastic marriage, you have to know your spouse and what they like and what they don't like. Man, you have to know the Torah of your wife, the, the idiosyncrasies that she has, the, the minute details that she likes. She likes this, and she doesn't like this. She wants you to do this, and she wants you to not do this. The, and, and husband, same way. We all have the different things that, that make us feel loved. When you know those and learn those, what are you doing? Not trying to be funny, but you're, you're riding those on the heart, and you're staying off the wrath of your spouse. When you learn the commandments of God, when you learn the instructions of the Most High God and you begin to put them into practice, and I'm not talking about just the top most obvious ones. I'm talking about in detail, learning how to love your, your, your neighbors, yourself, and learn how to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, which sounds so good, but is so difficult in reality. When we learn those details and put them into practice to when someone, here's when you know that you've arrived, ladies and gentlemen, and you're about to die, if you got to this, this level, if someone steps on your toe and you don't even remotely think to be offended because your thought is either they did it on accident or number two, they did it on purpose. Well, man, they must have a bad day. I need to pray for them. Because I know that deep down they wouldn't do it if they knew what they were doing. That's the level of holiness and spirituality that God's requiring. When we know his commandments, what is it doing? It is knowing and doing the commandments that opens up the heart. That lets him come in. He will not cross that threshold if he does not see faith worked out through works. That's what it is. It's the commandments of God written on the heart, and it's the blood of your faith in Messiah that lets him come in. You can't have just faith in Messiah and then walk away from God and say, I don't need to, I don't. It's like getting married and not ever coming home to, for dinner. You're married, but not for long. Now, you try to tell God it's once saved, always saved. It's like telling a wife it's once married, always married. You want to come cheat on me week, day in and day out and day in and day out. Even the Lord of the universe divorced his bride, ladies and gentlemen. There is a limit to grace. Now, that is not going to preach in today's world. I can guarantee it with this hyper grace garbage that's out there. But the God of the universe has enough at some point. He did it in, in, the, in Exodus with the Passover of what we're discovering here today. At the door, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, we've heard this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anybody hears my voice and opens up the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. Where do you think that scripture is coming from? Do you think he's just making up the idea of a door? I mean, he could have had all kinds of analogies that he used, but he decided to use at the standing at the threshold. He's not allowed to come in the threshold. He will never, he's a courteous guest. He's never going to come in until he is invited. The invitation in is that blood. But guess what? Even in the beautiful analogy of the Paschal Lamb in the first Passover, we still see the gospel in operation with faith and works. Why? Because the faith was, the blood was shed. The sacrifice was done. The works was you actually had to get your backside off the couch, turn off the television, get the hyssop branch out and dip it in there and put it on your doorpost. You had to do something. You see how this is not a popular message today because we just want to say, believe in Jesus. But that's like saying, I believe that the lamb has been slaughtered, but I don't have to do a darn thing about it. I don't have to put it on my house. I don't have to actually do anything. He did it all. There's going to be a lot of people on judgment day. They're going to, they're going to wonder as they're standing in line for judgment. Why is this guy in my line? 
he shouldn't be going to heaven until they find out this ain't the heaven line. <laughs> we need to be very careful. And I'm not defining the gospel, ladies and gentlemen, that you have to do something. I'm saying that after the gospel's been in, into effect in your life, there is a requirement that you put priestly robes on and follow your rabbi. Boundaries are also thresholds, if you didn't know that. When you see a boundary, this is an ancient boundary, stone. They had stone walls. Now, I, I'll tell you, when I was in Scotland years ago, uh, there was, you know, we, we touched down in Edinburgh, and, and, and our guide took us on a bus, and we were, we were driving through Edinburgh, and he said, yeah, this is the new part of town. And I'm looking around, and I'm going, new? I mean, it's all drab stone and everything. I said, how, how new? And he said, well, this is about 220 years old. This is the new part. And I said, new part? That's the age of the United States of America. You know what I mean? And, uh, and as we got out in the countryside, he began to show us the old part. And then I understood why that was new. It was new because the old part was like this. The old part, you had six, little, listen to this. I was playing golf and there was 600 year old fences. I came to the turn the ninth hole at Turnberry, and there was like this uh, ruins of an ancient castle, and our caddy says, uh, hey, I, I said, Cheryl, take a picture of me on this. This is pretty neat. And the guy starts laughing. I said, what are you laughing for? He's like, you don't even know what you're sitting on, do you? I said, no, sh should I not sit on it? And he said, no, no, no. He's like, that's the castle in the home where William Wallace was born. Braveheart? I said, Cheryl, take another picture, you know. <laughs> I got it, right? I appreciated what I, I was doing once I understood. And so many of the things that we do today, we do not actually fully know what we're doing because we don't understand where they're coming from. These ancient boundary stones that God put in place are thresholds that are not allowed to be moved. These boundary stones literally say to the other person on the other side of the fence, no trespassing. This is my granddad's property. Yours ends here. Do not cross. If you cross, I have the right to do something to you that is not fun. God says the same way. You stay inside my castle walls and my boundary of my kingdom of what I said, and I have the right in my kingdom to protect you. If you choose to break and jump the boundary line fence, you can do that. I'm not going to make you follow me. I'm not going to make you keep my word. I'm not going to make you keep your word, but I have no legal right to protect you when you're on the other side of the fence. Why? Because he says that Satan is the God of this world. So when you are walking in his kingdom, don't be surprised when all kinds of stuff starts happening to you. And you wonder, God, where are you? Where are you? And you start whining and complaining about everything in your life. Are you sure that you're walking in kingdom authority? And which kingdom are you walking in? Oh, yeah, maybe the, see, the blood of, that's on your, you, I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm saying that on judgment day, absolutely, it's going to look at the doorposts of your heart and, and you're saved. But how many know that you can be saved and still walk like your father, the devil? Peter did. You can still have handcuffs on you and inheritance and blessings be pulled from you because you choose to do things your own way. And most of us spend most of our time, you know, in, in Christianity today, around the world, everyone, is, you know, focuses on salvation. And God says, you don't understand. Salvation is only the beginning of my love for you. One time my wife had this dream and it was one of the most incredible downloads and revelations. I'll never forget it because she was so excited to tell me. And she said, Jim, God revealed to me that we look at the cross from our two perspectives, that we look at the cross from our perspective, and we say it is the greatest form of love that anybody could ever do is lay down his life for his friend. So from us, there's no more. There's nothing greater. But from God's perspective, he chose the only thing on this planet that he could choose to express his love 
And it happened to be at the highest level on this planet. But from his perspective, it's the lowest. It's only the beginning. The blood, ladies and gentlemen, it's like we as Christians, we come before God's house. We come before the threshold and we get down on our hands and knees and we praise God for the blood and we should. But we stay at the threshold praising God for the blood when he says that's only the beginning of the meal. You haven't even got to sup with me. Just because the lamb was slaughtered, that's just your invitation to join me. Amen. We haven't even gotten to the intimacy that I desire for you. God wants to bring us to the intimacy, yeah. to the inner chambers, not just shake our hand on the outside of the threshold. Yeah. We can't move the boundary stones. Proverbs 22, 28 says this. It says, do not remove the ancient landmarks which your fathers have set. And he's specifically talking about this. Matter of fact, how many remember the parable when Yeshua, Jesus is on the, 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 uh, the, the Sea of Galilee, if I remember correctly. And he's saying about don't build your house on sand, right? Build it on the rock, right? How many know that that is a Jewish idiomatic expression well known in the first century that the shifting sands were an idiomatic expression that meant the doctrines and changing traditions of man. And the stone or the rock was referenced to the written word of God that never changes. God says my word is a rock multiple times all through the Psalms. And so this phrase or this, this parable was developed that don't build your house on sand, on the shifting sands of men. And by the way, how does sands shift on a beach? When the water of the word washes right up on them, they can't even handle it. And it washes away everything they've built. But it's the rock that never moves. That's what we're supposed to build. That is an ancient boundary stone. That's why it says, don't move it. It's a foundation. You move the foundation and what happens to the house? Sayonara. It's the guarding of the door. Genesis chapter three, verse 24 says this. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way to the tree of life. So listen to this. If, if this was... The first verse that you read, okay, we're in Genesis, so it's the first chapter, first few chapters. You can understand, maybe not getting a picture, but by the time the Torah rolls around and God gives the instructions to build the tabernacle, you should be able to go back to Genesis chapter three and see something that you didn't see before. Because we have in the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies, these things called cherubim, these beautiful angels made out of gold with wings that are touching in the form of the Hebrew letter Kof which looks like this. And that cough in ancient Paleo Hebrew means it's, it's the hand that anoints. It's curved because it's the hand that gets placed on the head, which begins the process of curving. That is a Hebrew letter cough in Paleo ancient pictograph Hebrew, and it means to anoint. And so the, the, the wings of the cherubim are in the form of the letter cough, which means to anoint that which is touching. And what is sitting under the wings of the cherubim? Nothing more than the king of the universe. And so we see this cherubim, the cherubim, in the Garden of Eden. What does that tell us retroactively? The Garden of Eden is the Holy of Holies. In the midst of the garden is the Holy of Holies. You see, there's the Garden of Eden. That's the holy place. Then there's the midst of the garden. That is the Holy of Holies, where the cherubim were, where the flaming swords were. Is this making sense? It will in just a second, because what happens when they take part of that fruit? God removes them from the Holy of Holies and shuts the curtain. Forever, all the way up, shouldn't say forever, for a long period of time, the Holy of Holies, the center of the garden, the midst of his intimacy was shut off for mankind. No way. If they crossed the threshold of that covenant illegally, they would be destroyed by the sword. 
By the word of God. What proceeds out of the mouth of God but the sword of God? What comes from the throne of God but the fire of God? This is why when Nadab and Abihu, the two sons of Aaron, came close to, to Yahweh to offer profane fire, they didn't know that. They were killed. They were killed because they came and they crossed the threshold covenant floor unauthorized. The wrong way. That's why the Bible says there's only one way to enter into that covenant. The most primitive temple out there, ladies and gentlemen, was just a doorway and an altar. As long as there was a doorway and an altar, and that still remains in effect for today in Jerusalem, they will eventually start sacrifices up again. And I have been told by the Temple Institute in Jerusalem that they do not need to build the temple to start sacrifices because they believe that the sky is the temple. They only need an altar. A doorway and an altar in ancient Israel. So here's what we've got. Let's break this down a little bit. So this is, an, this is the ancient tabernacle of Moses. You have the eastern gate there on the bottom left-hand corner. And then once you walk into the eastern gate, by the way, every single firstborn was allowed, originally invited to come into that gate until the golden calf. Once the golden calf happened, it switched from the firstborn to the Levites then only the Levites would be the ones that would be allowed to go into that eastern gate. So the gate was open and, and in, invited for all at first, and then it was just the Levites. So once they come into the gate, what's the first thing they come to? The brazen altar. The brazen altar is where the sacrifice of the lambs were made. Then what happens? What's the next uh, symbol that you come to? The next object you come to is the brazen laver. What is the laver filled with? Water, okay? And so we have the, we have the sacrifice, then we come to water, and then we come to this interesting tent, tent of meeting, where God dwelled, and there were multiple levels to get there. You had the threshold, you had the holy place, and then at the final resting place was the holy of holies. So let's see and go on a journey if we can discover this pattern of the door, the altar, the water, and the holy place and the holy of holies in the journey of the Passover. Just so you can see how we're going to connect all this. Yeshua says, I am the way. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the door. We know that. There's no question about it. Actually, before we go through the journey, got to slide out of place there, but the basin, let's talk about the basin so we can make some connections. Exodus 12, 22, you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood that's in the basin and strike it on the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that's in the basin. Okay. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. Now, how many of you have seen pictures or watched movies where some guy has a bowl and he's dipping the hyssop branch into the bowl of blood and then putting it onto the door. That's what we see. But that is not at all what this says. It says the blood that's in the basin. None of you should go out of your house till morning. So let's discover what the word basin is. It's soft in uh, Strong's number 0552 for those of you that are taking notes. It means a spreading out, a basin, a goblet. It can mean a bowl, a basin, a goblet. But when you're dealing with sacrifices at the threshold, it literally means threshold or sill. Threshold, sill, or doorkeeper. And so many of the authors, because the, uh, the translators, because they're English translators, don't understand some of the Jewish culture, chose the word bowl many times in some of the, the uh, translations. But the real definition, interpretation should be threshold or the sill, okay? The very basis, that groove is what it is. And there was that bowl that I showed you. The bowl is built in to the threshold, okay? So this is what they're talking about. This is the basin on that first century door or that ancient door, even long before the first century comes along. They dip it into that blood and that's what they put on the door. Talk about the lintel. Now you can turn your head if you want to, but I want to show you some graphic pictures of our Messiah as he, he died on the cross for our sins. He's actually fulfilling the perfect threshold covenant of 
we always see the blood on three areas, not realizing there, for, for the threshold covenant to be complete, it must be four. It must be all four. The entire door has to be fully consumed in blood. It is the doorpost, it is the lintel, and it, it is the threshold. All of that. You are literally walking through a ring, if you will, a box that has blood all the way around it. There's no way to get around it. Uh, there's nothing left but blood on all four corners. And I believe that the Messiah is the mezuzah. He is the doorpost. That's why he says, put me on the doorpost of your heart. He is showing us the doorpost, and I'll show you why. I believe that the crown of thorns is the lintel. That is his head, and that's what it, it means. It's the top. It's the head of the door. The blood was shed on his head, which I believe that's why he had to have a crown of thorns. The doorpost is clearly his arms, because if you look at a human being, uh, you have the arms, you have the head, and you have the feet. The arms are the doorpost full of blood. The threshold, he was cursed for our sins. Galatians 3.13 says his feet had to have spikes run through them because they are the completion of the door. Yeshua says, I am the door, which means according to that, which wasn't just a stroke of genius or a great analogy he was using, he's saying, I am the fulfillment of the Passover lamb that you guys did 1,200 years ago when you marked the doorpost on the sides and the lintel and the threshold. I am going to be marked on the forehead, on the hands, and on the feet. I am the door fully completed and consummated. Amen? All four sides were complete. Going back to Passover, Exodus chapter, 20, uh, Exodus chapter 12, verse 13. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. We've read this a thousand times. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. What I want to do is I want to find out what does the word Passover mean? Because it's actually two Hebrew words put together. Pesach, okay. Everybody say Pesach. Pesach. Very good. Pesach means to pass over, to spring over, uh, to skip, to hop, to pass over. But that's just one part of that it's, is the word pass. The word over is al. This is where you get the paschal lamb, to pass over. It means to above, over, upon, through, or against. If it's negative context, it can mean against. Okay, so it can mean, this is where I believe the translators made their mistake, is because it can mean to go over. The only way that you're going to know if it means through is by context, or against by context again, if it's negative. And because we know of the threshold covenant, this ancient Eastern covenant of the threshold and the blood that's put in the groove and in that basin, we know that this Paschal, this Passover, is not a Passover, it's a pass-through. And I'll explain it as we move here. So Passover what? That's the question. The threshold. This is what the Passover is talking about. It's not talking about passing over the whole house. It's talking about passing over the threshold. That's what this covenant is all about. This is why they were protected. The God of the universe, if he did not see the blood on the lintel and on the doorpost, then he passed through and destroyed. If he saw the blood, just like anybody that's on the inside of a house, when a sacrifice is made, when you see the blood, it's an invitation for dinner. You see, the blood has already been shed. Therefore, I can pass over the threshold and I can dine. I can be intimate. I can have relationship. I don't, need to I don't need to cast blood because the blood has already been cast. You see, it's not a pass over. It's a pass through. It's a pass into. It's the dining with the king moment. What was happening, ladies and gentlemen, on that Passover night is the God of the universe was creating a covenant with his people. He's dining with his people. And I can tell you this much, that when the death angel shows up, when he sees the creator of the universe dining with the Israelite, he's not about to go in. Protection 
happens when God is in your house. That's the beauty behind the Hebrew language. The very first two letters in Hebrew are Aleph and Bet. Aleph means the head of or the leader. Bet or Bet is, means house. So Aleph and Bet together mean the leader of the house. Go figure that Aleph and Bet together is the Hebrew word for father. Av, Abba, where we get the word Abba from is Aleph and Bet. That's how you spell it. The father is in the house. There is protection. It all starts with this threshold covenant. It all starts with the sacrifice of the lamb. Matthew chapter 26, verse 28 says, this is my blood of the covenant. Which covenant? Which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Have you ever wondered what he's talking about there? Poured out? He's not talking about pouring his blood out on the ground. This is an ancient custom, a powerful covenant. He didn't say, you know, hey, listen, this is the blood of my, you know, uh, the thing I want to do for you guys. No, it's the blood of my covenant. This is a threshold covenant. This is a second rendition of the Passover where the blood of the lamb is poured out into the basin and then runs through the groove and then he invites you to come in and sup with you. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29 makes it very clear what happens. This verse is going to come to life for you. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Listen, counting the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace. This is an allusion, a direct allusion to what we read earlier in the Tanakh. When you trample the blood on the threshold, when you step on the blood, you're trampling on the Son of God. And people don't understand that, that if you want to dine with the king, you don't step on his blood, meaning that you don't reject it, you don't try to make it what you want to be. You have to step over the threshold to respect the blood of God. The blood of the Most High King that came and gave his blood for you. This is the threshold journey I wanted to share with you. The altar, when you walk in to the, into the, the courtyard itself, the first thing that we said you come to is what? The altar. That's the Passover sacrifice. So the first thing that happens when they leave Egypt is there is an altar erected in a way. There's a doorpost and there is a altar, that family altar. The Passover lamb was shed for that firstborn. That firstborn was, was redeemed, which we'll talk about in a different message on Passover, but redeemed with the blood of the lamb that happens at the altar in the courtyard. Very first thing item that you come to, period, is the altar. It just so happens that the very first part of the journey was the shedding of the blood. So the next thing that happens in, if you're walking through the altar, once you go uh, past the sacrifice, you come to the brazen laver that's filled with water. So it doesn't surprise you that the first thing that they come to is the Red Sea. And what do they do at the brazen laver? What are the priests required to do? The priests are required to look into the brazen laver, which is polished brass. That's what mirrors were made of back then. And they would see the dirt on themselves and they would cleanse their hands and their feet with the water in the brazen laver. Representational of being mikvahed before they go into the holy place. They had to be completely clean. What's happening when they go through the Red Sea? They are being mikvahed, immersed. They are, and what does this look like if you, if you were a, if God was about to birth his children, this is a birthing canal. He's literally birthing the Israelites into existence through the water of the canal, baptizing them. And what, what happens is the Bible says when you are baptized, when you are mikvahed, is that the old man is done away with. And behold, when you come out of the water, you are brand new. What is happening? Who did they used to hang around and be like? The Egyptians. The Egyptian army had to follow them into the Red Sea to fulfill the prophecies and the beautiful shadows of baptism that the old man must die. It cannot live. It cannot stand at a distance and watch, 
hoping that you'll come back across the Red Sea. It must die. If you're going to be a new creature, it must die. Your will must die. Your mind, your will, your emotions, everything about you must die and be drowned in the sea. That's what baptism is all about. It's death of the old man, resurrection of the new. When they came out on the, old, on the other side, the song of Moses was given. Why? Because death was defeated. The enemy was defeated. And they came out on the other side, new people, a people of God, the scriptures say. So now in our journey through the tabernacle, we've gone through the altar, the Passover lamb. We came to the brazen uh, laver. That is the Red Sea. And then what should be next? We're going to meet God in the tabernacle, right? The tabernacle has a threshold. It has a holy place and it has the holy of holies. Watch this, how cool God is to show literally the journey of the tabernacle or the Passover in the Passover story itself. We come to Mount Sinai. What is the base of Mount Sinai called? It's the threshold. What does God say? Do not let them cross that threshold. Do not let them cross the base of that mountain and come up to me or they will die because the way had not been made. A sin was committed. If they cross the threshold, they will die. If you don't respect the rules and you move the boundary stones an inch, you will die. There's protocols to come approach our king. And the first one was at the base of Mount Sinai. You can see all the people there. Then, well, we got two more rooms now left. So wouldn't it be interesting to discover that there should be, if the, the mountain represents the tabernacle of God, there should be two levels on the mountain. And we certainly see that. We see Moses going up with Aaron and the 70 elders. And God says, stay here halfway up on the mountain, about three quarters of the way up on the mountain. You, Moses, come all the way up into my panim, into my presence, into my glory. Is this making sense? You see in the pictures here. It's all, see, you never see this. I mean, it's, it's so amazing, so beautiful. How many other things are in the scriptures we don't see? They're just historical bedtime Bible stories, and they're pictures of, of the living God and his love for us written all through it. The tabernacle, he was literally creating the template of the tabernacle through their own journey, and they didn't even see it. I never seen it. 40 years I've been alive. I've never seen it until this week. I never saw this. So let me ask this question to make it personal. How many of you believe that you're a child of God? How many of you believe that God's calling you out of Egypt? Then would you believe that he's going to have a different template for you or the same template? And that same template is this. He is using your spiritual journey to create a tabernacle that he can dwell in. Everything that's happened in your life, he is taking you on a journey and the, and the situations and the circumstances, listen, some of you that are listening at home tonight, the circumstances in your life are terrible. You look on the left and you look on the right, you see nothing but the walls of water. I'm telling you, you are being birthed. Don't stop. Don't deny what God is doing in your life. He's birthing you. He's taking you into a new place, a place where he wants you and inviting you. And he says, cross my covenant threshold. The blood has been shed. The way has been made. I want you, John, Cindy, Stephen, Mary, Brittany, whatever your name is. I want you to come up to the mountain. You are a holy priesthood. You are a nation that I have set aside for me. You are my inheritance. No longer do you have to have a mediator. Your mediator shed his blood and gives you permission to come up to the mountain. Come on. Everything. Listen to me. If you get nothing else out of this message, understand this. The journey that God has you on he did it for a reason. You quit now and turn around, you're going to miss the mountain. Some of you have no idea because you're walking along with your pals and all you're doing is going, man, I just I miss Egypt. I just miss Egypt. There's so many things about Egypt. I like the figs and the steaks and all that stuff. They even had spices. What would I do for spices on my manna right now? You can't eat quail without pepper and salt. 
And in all of your whining and complaining about the difficult parts of your life and looking over your shoulder, you don't even see the mountain right in front of you. It's a dry and weary place. Yes, in the, in the winter. Yes, in the valley. Yes, in the deserts. It's dry. It's difficult. Sometimes it's dark. But God says, your life is the journey into the Holy of Holies. Why would you stop? Pursue the difficult parts in life. Embrace them as the, as the, the waypoints, if you will. How many know that, that when they crossed the Red Sea, they set up and erected rocks, a pillar to remember? So that difficult, difficult part of their journey, they had no idea how difficult it was going to get. They erected something they could always go back to. When you go through a difficult journey, what we want to do is forget it as fast as possible. What if everything, just pretend with me for a minute, that everything that happens in your life is from God? Do you want to forget what he did in your life? How did you learn obedience, Israelite? How many of you know your Bibles? How did Yeshua learn obedience? Through suffering. We don't want to be obedient because we're American Israelites. We're cowboys from the start, breaking off from Britain. Nobody's going to tell us what to do. We are an arrogant breed of 3,000-year-old ancestors. We're no different. We want it our way. We're going to step on the threshold. We're going to disrespect the blood of the living God by not pursuing him and complaining at every place that we can. God says that everything that happens in your life is for a purpose. It's to bring you to the top of the mountain. Please don't quit your journey. And I don't mean like quit, quit. I mean quit complaining. When you complain about what's happening in your life, it's quitting. Because if you're complaining, the precedent in scripture, I'm just a math guy, former financial planner. Everything I see is, is formulas. I go, okay, complaining about what God's doing in my life. Here's the formula. 39 more years. I'm going to keep going in the desert. I'm going to keep being thirsty. I'm going to keep complaining. And every once in a while, he's going to throw me a bone like some quail. And then he's going to throw me some flatbread. Oh, that's nice. Oh, it's great when you got it because you want something. While they got grapes this big in the promised land waiting for you, you're all excited about a quail this big. The father has so much more planned for you. The next time, I have said this so many times over the last year, when circumstances come, embrace them. How many know the enemy has no power over a believer unless you give him authority? So when you're walking a righteous life, ladies and gentlemen, if the enemy steps into your life, it's because God allowed him to do it on purpose to set you free. Some of you don't understand what I just said. He lets the enemy. It would shock you, some of you, and probably heresy if I quoted a scripture that said God sent a lying spirit. But he did. It's going to mess with your theology. But God lets the enemy and allows the enemy and even says, fine, go have my servant Job. Because what you don't know is I see the sal you know, saliva coming out of your mouth from your teeth and the blood on your, your stained teeth. I know you want him bad. But what you don't know is I'm going to use you to expose something in his life. And because I believe in my servant, when he, when he gets exposed, he's going to repent of it. And he will be twice the son of God as he was before. The enemy is sent to make you twice the son or daughter. So the next time the enemy shows up at your front door, say, welcome, where's my sword? So I can cut your head off today, right? <laughs> Let's continue. Jeremiah 31, 33, we're almost done. But this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. You've heard this. I will put my law on their minds. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Everything is about this 
covenant of walking over the threshold and dining with our king. This is why Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 says this, and I'll, I said it before, I'm going to say it again, because I want you to recognize that in the front of the book, in the back of the book, the same concept exists. It's this, I stand at the door and the knock, and I ask, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. The Passover is all about, it's not just about Jesus being the Passover lamb. It's about fulfilling ancient customs and prophecies of the threshold covenant, setting the stage for blood. Listen, if blood was only on the doorpost and the lintel, we'd have a giant problem because the enemy can just come right in underneath. Ask any witch doctor. I only know this because I had a friend that lived in Kenya and he would tell me some of these things. When you deal with, with witches, and with, they know this stuff. It has to be fully all the way around to ward off spirits. That's why it ain't on three sides. That's why the doorpost of your, your hearts, ladies and gentlemen, it ain't just on three sides. He better own all of your heart. Don't think that you can pretend to serve your God halfway. You're taking a major risk on judgment day. And if you do make it, it will be difficult and you will run through misery all the days of your life because the enemy will be half in your house while God is half in your house. And Yahweh will always, always yield to whatever you want. So whatever you want to do, he stands back because he's a gracious, courteous guest. This is not my house. This is your house, sir. Whatever you want me to do, you want me to rule your house, I will. You want me to just sit in the corner, I will. And on judgment day, I'm going to let you in, maybe. But if you want to have life and abundant, then you need to let me rule with the iron fist that I have, and I'll clean this house so fast, nothing will stand, and the blessings will flow through every crevice, crack, window, and garage door will open for the treasures that I have for you. God is not looking for part-time servants. He's not looking for part-time slaves. He's looking for bond servants. There's a difference. You know what a bond servant is different? They took a wooden dial, nailed your right ear to the doorpost, signifying that you are owned by the master. When they saw that earring, you're owned. I bet people, that guys that wear earrings today don't know that. But it's time today that we take the blood of our lives, our sweat and tears, and we say, okay, so let me just challenge you, because I feel like this is what God wants to do to end this. What are you holding back from him? What have you like left outside of the threshold as you want to come in? Because my God says that you can't, anything you leave out is gone. There's no access to. You can't just keep walking over the threshold. It says you come in and you dine with me and I'll dine with you. A hundred percent. Never in the scriptures did God ask for disciples to say, I want to be a disciple, sign me up and keep fishing on their, on their boat. It didn't happen. Some of you are so blessed in your life and you don't even know it because you have given it all. But we can see it. When I meet with you, I can see the spiritual growth. You don't see it because you're on your journey no more than the spiritual Israelites never looked at the Red Sea as being baptized. They never looked at the Egyptians as the death of the old man. They never looked at the, at the covenant threshold as the base of Mount Sinai. They never saw the top of it as the Holy of Holies. They didn't see it, but God did. When you give everything up, take a chance for God. Amen. If, he, if he lets you down, there's a reason. You missed a turn. But it's not the end of the world. I've had things, I've had something happen in my life this week where, you know, I chose somebody to help me with something not related to anything spiritual. And I, and I thought this is the guy to help me. Anybody like hire somebody? You're like, this is the guy. And three weeks later you go, this ain't working. Not at all. And so you look, man, Lord, how do I tell this guy that I need to, this is a true story. How do I tell this guy that, that this ain't working? God, I need you to help me with this. And, and, and within like an hour or two, that person resigned. 
and said, I don't think I should do this anymore. Praise your God. I don't have to do the dirty work. It's not my problem. If things don't work out, he's the one guiding me in the wilderness. Does that make sense? Stand with me. We're going to pray and then we're going to take an offering. And then we'll conclude. Matt, you can come on up. Father, thank you so much for the blood of your son that was poured out for us, for our transgressions. The Lord, at the base of the door, the base of the mountain, you're inviting us to come higher. Lord, I don't know what that is for each person that's in here. I have no idea what it means for them to go higher. But Lord, they do. They know what they're holding back. They know their struggles. They know the things that they're, that they're withholding from you what's rightfully yours. Father, I pray in the name of your great son that you prick their hearts, that they would not hold back any longer, that, Lord, they would give you what's rightfully yours, their whole life, their mind, their will, their emotions. Father, I pray that when they put their head on their pillow at night, they would consider the fact that they may not wake up there were a lot of firstborn Egyptians, God, that put their head on their pillows expecting to wake up, not knowing that it would be their last breath. Father, time is short on this earth. Even if you tarry, Lord, we live but 70, 80 years, it's a breath, it's, it's, it's nothing for us to live our own lives for the things that we want, we want to do. Let us consider your kingdom, God, first. And you promise that all these things will be added unto you. Put ourselves last and watch you invite us to the front of the line. God, is, it is an incredible privilege to serve, to love, to be the least. Father, thank you for everything that you teach me, even through my children. I pray, God, that someone in the sound of my voice would rededicate their life and be all in instead of standing at the threshold looking in. Amen.